Um, just as a reminder, we're going to ask you all to mute your phones. And then um, joining us in the room today is Secretary of Health Kim Molston Ryston, State Epidemiologist Dr. Josh Clayton, and South Dakota um, Director ah, Communications mm -hmm. Director Daniel Butrelli. At this time, I'll turn it over to Daniel. Good morning, everyone. Um, again, we apologize for the technical difficulties uh, at the Department of Health. We thrive on providing you all the latest updates on COVID-19 as it becomes available. And to that end, here's the latest statewide numbers. New confirmed cases, 128. New probable cases, 42. Active infections, 1,789. Recovered cases, 118,647. Currently hospitalized, 103. Total test performed, 1,159,692. Total unique persons tested, 464,622. With 122,398 positive cases, and 342,224 negative persons. We continue using the RT-PCR positivity rate since that measure is being used by the CDC as well as CMS for nursing home and long-term care facility reopening plans. That last seven-day number as of this morning is 7.1%. Additionally, 576,601 doses have been administered to 326,272 state residents this translates to 54% of the state population having received at least one dose and 44% of the state residents having completed their vaccination series. All this provisional data can be found on our COVID-19 dashboard, which is found at doh.sd.gov. A couple of additional announcements this morning. Starting in May, we will be shifting these briefings to once a month, with our next monthly briefing being held on, a, on May 12th, and the time will remain the same, 11.30 in the morning. Additionally, starting April 29th, updates to the data dashboard on covid.sd.gov will be posted daily Monday through Friday, and numbers from Saturday and Sunday will be updated on Tuesday's update. I will now turn it over to our state epidemiologist, Dr. Joshua Clayton. All right. Thank you, Daniel, for the updated numbers. Um, to provide a little bit of perspective around the COVID-19 cases, uh, I did want to note that for um, the last full week, uh, April 18th through the 24th, uh, we saw about an average of 133 cases per day. This is a 32% decrease uh, from the uh, previous week, April 11th through the 17th, when we saw 195 cases per day. Uh, it is a good reminder that uh, even though we're seeing decreased cases, that we want individuals to uh, still take precautions. And so uh, that includes, first and foremost, um, that now is your time to get vaccinated uh, against COVID-19 uh, and continue to, take, continue to take precautions such as uh, avoiding crowds, physically distance, uh, wear a mask when that is not possible, wash hands often, and stay home when you are sick. Uh, one quick update around the Johnson & Johnson vaccine is that on April 23rd, the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices met to discuss the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. The independent group of scientists voted to lift the pause and begin administering the Johnson & Johnson vaccine again. Uh, as part of the data that they looked at, um, they, a total of 15 cases uh, of blood, this rare blood clot um, were identified. Uh, and that was among 7.98 million persons who had been vaccinated with the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. Uh, so the, the blood clot still remains a rare event uh, with 1.9 million, uh, 1.9 cases per million persons vaccinated. The uh, evaluation uh, around the risk and benefit uh, of the vaccine uh, is, is as unfolds here. Uh, for per 1 million adults aged 18 and older, uh, we would expect uh, 1.9 cases uh, of this uh, rare blood clot, um, but the uh, benefits uh, of vaccination including, included more than 6,000 individuals um, who would avoid hospitalization and over 2,000 individuals uh, who uh, would avoid death from COVID-19. Uh, the uh, FDA and, and CDC did uh, issue uh, a uh, or added, excuse me, a warning about these rare blood clots with low blood platelets uh, to their product information as well as the vaccine safety sheet um, that is provided at time of vaccination uh, for individuals who are receiving that Johnson & Johnson COVID-19 vaccine. Uh, we also saw this week an update on the recommendations for fully vaccinated persons, and this is in non-healthcare settings. 
So uh, a fully vaccinated person is defined as a person who is 14 or more days uh, after receiving their, have passed after receiving their last dose of COVID-19 vaccine. So previously that list of activities included being able to visit indoors uh, with other fully vaccinated persons and not requiring a mask or physical distancing, uh, as well as visiting unvaccinated people from a single household. Uh, what is, has been added um, is now that individuals no longer need to wear their masks outdoors, uh, again, except if they're in a crowded location. Uh, so it does mean that individuals are able to um, you know, walk outdoors, attend small uh, gatherings such as uh, backyard barbecue, uh, or uh, visit a restaurant uh, uh, and be in the outdoor seating area with family and friends. Uh, those individuals who are fully vaccinated also uh, no longer need to quarantine or be restricted from work uh, following, an, following an exposure. Uh, and uh, fully vaccinated residents of non-healthcare congregate settings uh, no longer need to quarantine uh, following an exposure. Uh, asymptomatic people uh, also, uh, excuse me, asymptomatic people who are fully vaccinated um, also, uh, do not need to be tested before and after domestic travel, um, which was originally recommended by CDC, uh, as well as uh, they do not need to be tested prior to departure uh, for an international location unless it is required by the destination. Uh, and they also do, uh, uh, upon arrival back in the United States, um, it is recommended uh, that they get tested at their location, international location before they uh, board that uh, inter international flight. Uh, but they do not need to quarantine uh, after they have uh, arrived back in the United States. Um, we also want to make sure that folks um, are, uh, if they develop symptoms, whether or not they've uh, been vaccinated against COVID-19, uh, that they get tested uh, for that infection. Uh, and we have had a total of 198 individuals uh, who have ad been identified with uh, breakthrough infection. Uh, and that is uh, defined again as an individual who uh, was fully vaccinated uh, and uh, went on to have a positive test uh, for uh, the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Um, and with that, I will turn it over to Secretary of Health, Kim Nelson Rison. Thank you, Dr. Clayton and Daniel, and thank you to all who have joined us this morning. Uh, before we had op open this up to your questions, I want to just touch on a few facts. Um, since our last briefing, um, we've uh, seen over 576,000 dose, 76, doses of vaccine administered to South Dakotans. That's almost 69,000 uh, doses in a two-week period. We really want to thank all folks who have chosen to be uh, vaccinated as we know that that's the quickest way out of this pandemic. This week's allocation um, for vaccines uh, to the state is 24,170. That's broken out by 12,870 doses of Pfizer, 9,300 doses of Moderna, and 2,000 doses of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. And just as a reminder, these numbers do not include the supply that's being distributed uh, to IHS and the Veterans Administration or to the federal retail pharmacy programs um, directly from the federal government. Um, as Daniel mentioned, um, as of today, we've got 54% of our state uh, population age 16 and older who have received at least one dose and about 44% of our population in that same age range um, has fully completed their vaccination series. Uh, we know that vaccines work. But unfortunately, we have seen misinformation campaigns pop up, um, whether online, by mail, or other methods. And uh, we will uh, continue to do uh, you know, our work to counter uh, fear over facts. So this is what we know to be true. If you get infected, the COVID virus can travel all over your body and stay there, causing short-term issues and long-term problems. Uh, if you get the vaccine, it primes your system to counteract the virus. Um, if you become infected and thus helps you build resistance towards it. 95% of doctors who have studied the vaccine have taken it. And the quicker we put this pandemic behind us, the quicker we can get back to being our old self and grow our communities. Um, finally, we know that the COVID-19 vaccines work. Um, they save lives. Um, and again, they are going to be the way that we end this pandemic. Um, I've said this before, but I, I want to repeat it. Um, it's, it's normal for people to have questions. But to be fearful is not normal. So we really want people to get uh, information um, from trusted sources, um, including uh, the State Department of Health, um, the federal CDC, 
and uh, we encourage people to talk to their medical provider and get the facts. Um, again, in the U.S., we know we have, uh, we have the gold standard when it comes to vaccines and vaccine development procedures. All of the COVID-19 vaccines went through rigorous testing and development with no corners cut uh, when it comes to their safety and efficacy. The reason we have the accelerated timeline is because um, the federal government was able to cut through some of the normal bureaucracy associated with vaccine development. Um, and again, I think that the recent pause with the J&J &J vaccine um, really shows that the safety protocols in place do work and that if there is a potential problem um, that we will make sure that uh, we are doing the right thing to uh, protect the health of people in our country. The last bit I'd like to say is that testing does remain a critical component to fighting COVID-19. Um, so uh, if you um, are uh, looking to be tested, there are a lot of opportunities across the state, including a free opportunity um, by ordering a saliva-based kit on the covid.sd.gov website. It'll be mailed to you at your home um, to be uh, completed um, when you need it, um, and there is no charge to you or any South Dakotan for uh, completing this kind of test. Um, so we're encouraging people to order the test, keep it on hand um, in the event that they need it um, so that we can continue our response. So with that. Thank you, Madam Secretary and Dr. Clayton. At this time, we will open up the floor for your questions. If you could please identify yourself, your media outlet, and then ask your question. Who would like to go first? I'm Ray from Kelloland. Go ahead, Ray. Um, when you look at some of the research on the folks who are hesitant to get vaccines or, or resistant, um, it puts South Dakota kind of in a new, unique position because research and so, surveys are showing that a lot of those are, are males, white males, um, under 50. Um, the majority are not college educated. They identify as Republican and as a conservative Christian. Um, which, you know, is a lot of South Dakota in many ways, describes a lot of South Dakota. So on the same time, we're doing really well with vaccinations and people are getting it when you just gave those percentages. But how does that, how do you reach those folks that are so similar to the ones that are getting vaccinated um, but yet are still resistant? Is that, if, well, Ray, I guess um, I would just offer that, um, you know, uh, we don't see uh, vaccines as a political, um, Republican or Democratic uh, issue. Um, it's, you know, it's a science-based issue. And so we're going to continue to get the science and the facts out about vaccinations and people in, in South Dakota are responding to that. And so uh, we will continue to encourage people to get their um, information from verified sources. <laughs> um, and, you know, um, especially if you're seeing things come through social media, to be very careful um, to understand where that information is coming from and that it's, in fact, um, accurate and true. Um, and we will continue to, um, you know, do that outreach so that people can choose to become vaccinated. Next question, please. Jeremy, this is KOR News service. Radio. I heard Jeremy. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I had a question about the misinformation uh, topic. I just wondered what you're seeing out there. Is it a lot of individual stuff? Does it seem like there's some coordinated action when it comes to uh, casting doubt on the on the vaccine? What uh, and and uh, are you doing anything specifically to target that other than telling us about it? Um, well, Jeremy, I'll answer your second question first, which is, you know, when we come across misinformation, we um, try to correct that so that people can get the correct information about vaccines. And so um, when we come across that, we will uh, do what we can to uh, make sure people have the correct information. Um, we see um, a lot of that coming through social media. A lot of it is kind of individual um, individually focused. Um, you know, I heard this kind of thing. and. You know, or um, the other thing that we see pretty commonly is um, individuals um, assigning causal relationships to some kind of outcome to a vaccine. And um, we know through um, our monitoring that, you know, there are very few um, severe risks um, or adverse effects of vaccines. Um, and so um, we see those kinds of stories circulating often. Um, we also came across a mailed um, you know, uh, a piece, I guess, uh, for lack of a better word, that um, was wholly inaccurate and had many, um, you know, uh, claims of, 
you know, kind of conspiracy claims around um, vaccine development and, and people that are involved with that process. And um, so, again, we will refute those things and um, do what we can to help make sure people have those facts. Thanks. Next question, please. JP from KOR News Radio. Go ahead, JP. Thank you very much. Um, it's good to see that uh, a lot of people are getting vaccinated, uh, but what about the percentage of those who got their first dose of a vaccine, be it Moderna or Pfizer, and have not gotten their second? How, m how many do you have on those? Yeah, so we, we do have a number of individuals um, that have uh, received their first uh, dose of vaccine uh, and uh, have not uh, gone back to um, the same location in order to get their second dose of vaccine. Um, so that number as of Monday is 5,843 individuals uh, who are at least uh, 42 days um, after their second, or sorry, after, after their 42 days after their first dose uh, of COVID-19 vaccine. Um, now, individuals who are uh, at that stage or, or um, have received longer than 42 days ago, uh, do not need to restart um, the series, um, but we do try to make sure that they receive the, the maximum protection from uh, the COVID-19 vaccine. Uh, and so we want uh, to be able to uh, get them back in and get their second dose so that they are fully protected. Uh, now, we don't have any uh, specific factors around uh, you know, uh, who is uh, missing you know, their second dose of, of uh, vaccine at this point, um, and you know, we want to make sure that uh, folks are uh, uh, reaching out, getting any questions answered, using reliable information, um, and that, that includes uh, going to the cdc.gov website, as well as covid.sd.gov website, uh, if they have any questions on uh, their vaccine um, uh, so that they can finish their second dose. Thank you. Next question, mm -hmm. Next question please. Yes, Hi, uh, I could not understand. Can we? Jerry, Talk go about. ahead. No, you go ahead. Okay. You first. Yep, right. whoever wants to go. Okay, I'll go. Todd at kello.com news. Thanks, Jerry. Uh, the Associated Press reported uh, in Iowa that 80 of the 99 counties um, have been turning back vaccines because, I guess, of the hesitancy issue. Have has South Dakota seen any issues with um, providers or anybody else? And I understand Iowa has a different way of how they distribute the vaccine than South Dakota. Have we have you seen any hesitancy? Um, by anybody's part to not accept uh, the allocations of, of vaccines, like any of the hospitals or so forth? So, Todd, thank you for that question. Um, we're actually um, in the midst of transitioning to an on-demand ordering system so that the providers that are providing vaccinations to South Dakotans will be able to order what they anticipate being able to deliver. Um, and that just works, you know, well for them. That's how vaccines are ordered, um, you know, most um, most commonly, um, and so um, you know, to the degree that we um, that they may not anticipate um, needing, you know, up to the current level of state allocation, then those doses will remain available at the federal level, and so you know, we will make sure that we're not uh, sitting on them and potentially wasting them, and I think that's in everybody's best interest that way. Um, so yeah, and so it's really um, you know a more efficient way of kind of handling that part of the process, and then again. Um, yeah, as we've seen more access points across uh, the state, that's just a more normalized way of, of um, how they can access those vaccines. Uh, so, Madam Secretary, so just maybe to clarify, so is anybody um, turning back any vaccine currently? So is like Sanford no. or Monument? Okay. No, and we have a very collaborative process. Um, you know, I think we've maybe described that in the past where we talk about what we're um, you know, getting allocated at the state level and just really where the need is across the state and work, you know, collaboratively to, to get the vaccine to where it's needed. All right. Thank you. I believe, yep. I believe Jeremy Gutierrez, News Center 1. Yeah, Go thanks. Uh, yeah, I guess an, uh, the question I had is, an, is, are you concerned that in the midst of a pandemic you have to persuade people to get a vaccination? I don't recall that persuasion needed, uh, for instance, when the polio vaccine came out. You know, how concerning is that? 
Well, you know, again, um, you know, we're just encouraging people to make the choice to be vaccinated, and we're going to continue to do that. Um, you know, I've been vaccinated. I think it, it was the right choice for me and, and members of my family have as well. Um, and sometimes people just need, to, you know, to hear the information a couple of different times to make that choice for themselves, and uh, we're going to work within, um, you know, that uh, that paradigm. Um, but, you know, I, I do think at the end of the day, South Dakotans do make the right choices for themselves and their families, and I'm optimistic that we'll continue to see um, people choosing to be vaccinated. Next question, please. Jeremy Gutierrez, New Center One. Go ahead. Um, yeah, what is the, um, what's the guidance for um, families who may have uh, kids who are younger than 16 and can't get vaccinated? What is the, uh, what's like the recommended um, uh, CDC guidelines for that? Yeah, so uh, when, when those, uh, you're talking about a household that is not fully vaccinated um, because you have uh, individuals uh, within that household uh, who are not eligible for vaccine, uh, we do want individuals to continue to take uh, precautions. Um, you know, the um, likelihood of uh, symptomatic as well as asymptomatic infection, uh, say in, in parents uh, who have been fully vaccinated, uh, is, is small. Um, and so while the parents are able to, um, uh, you know, kind of do some of the things um, that I've just mentioned around uh, what fully vaccinated individuals can do, uh, we still want to make sure that uh, uh, certain precautions are taken um, for uh, children in the family. Now, if that's uh, fully vaccinated grandparents uh, coming to visit uh, a household of individuals who are not fully fully vaccinated, um, you know that is fine because you have one household who is fully vaccinated. Um, if we're talking about uh, you know, mixing um, multiple households together, uh, where you have some individuals who are vaccinated and unvaccinated, um, you know that does uh, potentially pose a risk of COVID-19 transmission, and so. It, you know, we want individuals to uh, know uh, what the, the risk is uh, when they are, are doing certain activities. And um, that's why CDC has come out with uh, guidelines of how to safely um, you know, get together. Uh, you, can, you can do so, um, but the recommendations uh, are for wearing of a mask uh, and, and physically distancing when possible. Uh, and really, when you have fully vaccinated individuals, that's when uh, the, the masking as well as the distancing uh, uh, becomes uh, less of a, uh, of a need um, to, uh, because that risk of transmission has decreased. Thank you. Hi, uh, this is George Encinas from Capital Journal. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, I was wondering, so how has the J&J &J pause played it? Have people been specifically requesting not to get that, that brand of dose? Um, you know, we've seen, um, we've seen some of that, but we've also seen people um, that are actually waiting for the J&J &J vaccine. Um, so, um, you know, obviously, um, you know, the pause was needed to make sure that we could address any potential safety concerns, and we're confident that it remains a safe option for people um, and that, you know, with the enhanced guidance that's out on it, um, it's, you know, just going to really en enhance the safety profile. But, um, you know, again, uh, we're telling people that the best shot is the first one available. So, um, you know, we've seen people uh, waiting for that one, and that's the prerogative, but um, just really encourage people to, to make that appointment today. Next Thank question, please. Um, Ray from Kelland, if I can. Uh, go ahead, Ray. Hi. Yeah, we, we've talked a lot about vaccinations and reaching people. Can you be a little more specific um, uh, about how you're trying to reach people? Are you like something like saying we need X number of social media posts per day or we need to do a public service announcement at this time or at these events or we need to leverage someone with, quote, celebrity status in South Dakota to kind of help? Thank you. Sure, Ray. I'm um, happy to answer that here. Well, what you see from the Department of Health is meeting people where they are. So whether they're online on social media, whether that's Facebook or Twitter, we've also done um, TV PSAs as well as on the radio. You should see those, and that's being broadcasted uh, statewide. We're also working with uh, numerous stakeholders, including tribes, uh, helping them uh, with the resources and guidelines and whatnot as to uh, how they can best reach their populations. We're also, uh, we did a statewide mailer to every resident across the state uh, with information on how to connect to a vaccine provider, as well as how to order the, um, the COVID-19 test kits the Secretary mentioned about earlier. So 
So we are uh, and also placing ads in newspapers and magazines across the state, so again, pushing vaccination and information on uh, testing. And in addition to those um, kind of statewide efforts, we do also do um, targeted outreach efforts to communities. We've um, partnered with tribes in FEMA mm -hmm. on some recent um, vaccination opportunities in some tribal communities. Uh, we have also done uh, Facebook, what's the term, Danielle, geo? Geofencing. <laughs> Geofencing. Um, you know, when we know we've had vaccine available in communities and have not had appointments filled, and those have been very successful as well. So. I would tell you that it's an ongoing, um, ongoing effort, a daily effort um, that includes both targeted and statewide things. And I would also say um, thank you to all of you for helping yeah. us also get the word. Absolutely. Okay. With um, that, we have time for one more question. Can I please have the last question? Um, hearing none, we would like to thank you for participating in today's media call.